This is Roger Ebert. Sooner or later, everyone who loves movies gets to the work of Yasujiro Ozu, the great Japanese master who was born in 1903 and died in 1963 on his birthday, December the 12th. During those 60 years, Ozu created a group of works that stand alone in terms of their beauty, their simplicity, and their consistency. He returned again and again to the same kinds of themes and the same kinds of stories. In fact, so much was he a creature of, well, not habit maybe, but repetition, that almost all of his films begin like this against a background of a simple mat. So when you see that mat, you know that you're entering into a world that will not be highly charged with plots and uh, with special effects, but into a contemplative world. A world that the critic Paul Schrader wrote in his book about Ozu and Bresson and Dreyer is a world of transcendental film, films that try to lift us up out of the ordinary and to invite us to contemplate the beauty and the simplicity, the tragedy and the joy of ordinary human life. When I was asked to do a commentary track for an Ozu film, I was a little hesitant at first because I am not an expert on the works of Ozu, although I have seen and loved many of them. But there are people who know ever so much more about Ozu and Japanese cinema than I do, and I'm glad that two of them in particular are going to be doing commentary tracks for other DVDs in this Criterion series. They would be Donald Ritchie, who has lived in Tokyo since the late 40s, and David Bordwell, professor of cinema at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, whose knowledge is equally awesome. My approach on this one is going to be more direct, uh, to actually look at the screen, because Ozu, more than most directors, place composition above everything else. This is the first of four establishing shots. I'm going to be talking about these shots, not necessarily as they're on the screen, because they move along fairly quickly, and we'll have to think back on them. But here we see that the lighthouse is more or less on the same axis of the composition in four shots in a row. And the first shot of the bottle and the lighthouse is kind of quiet wit. I don't know that it represents anything more than a sort of amusement at the fact that the bottle and the shape of the lighthouse are more or less the same. It may be of interest, as Ritchie points out, that Ozu probably drank more than any other major director. And when he was writing screenplays, now, he actually charted the progress of the screenplay by how many bottles of sake he and his collaborator had gone through. Now, this is interesting that we meet these characters who are not major characters in the film. In fact, most of them will never be seen again. They're talking about the arrival of a theatrical troupe in this town, this small, isolated coastal town. If you look carefully at these shots and at some of the others, you'll see that frequently Ozu places his camera in such a way that the characters are not necessarily looking at each other as far as the camera is concerned, although they are certainly looking at each other in terms of the actual physical space that they inhabit. He was relatively indifferent to the idea of continuity in matching visual shots. Uh, he was more interested in creating visual compositions uh, that would be attractive. There we have two people side by side, looking more or less in the same position, in a, in a composition that we're going to see again and again through the film with two, three, four, even five people. Now back again to the original shot of the lighthouse. 